Imagine with me a man who is old in years. Uh, he's chained in prison. He's nearing the end of his life. Uh, not because of his gray head or the conditions in which he was being held, but by the wrath of his in enemy. What would go through your mind if you were in the same position? Would you reflect on your life, asking yourself if you had lived a worthy life? Uh, did you do what you were called to do? Was every trial worth it? Uh, well, this is where we find Paul uh, in this book. He's in prison. He's nearing death, which will soon come uh, by the hand of Nero. But many in this position, you would think they'd be scared, they'd be sad, uh, they'd be filled with re regret, but not Paul. Uh, in this letter to his beloved son in the faith, our last known account from Paul, it's actually a challenge to this young minister to continue in the sound doctrine uh, and finish strong in the same way that his mentor did. And so Paul, nearing the end of his life, was bold that everything was all worth it. So 2 Timothy 4, uh, verses 7 through 8 actually say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So surely, desiring the same end for his beloved son, uh, he writes this letter hoping to encourage, but I would say uh, hoping more so to challenge the young Timothy to follow in his footsteps so that he would also be bold on the doorsteps of death. And so obviously this was a concern for Paul or else he wouldn't have been writing this message to Timothy. And if you remember uh, from, sec or from la not, not last week, two weeks ago, Tom preached uh, in 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, which say, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And from what I can remember, uh, Tom didn't have time to go into this specific thing, but if we go to the next portion of verses after that, um, we actually learn some things and we can see how Timothy was to respond due to the fact that, he, that God hadn't given him a spirit of fear. And so 2 Timothy 1.8 says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And so, uh, as Tom said, la I believe it was last week, when you see the word therefore, you always need to ask, what is it there for? Okay, and so the context of why it's there is in verses 6, six through 7, which we, which we just read. And so due to the fact that God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind, Paul challenges Timothy not to be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord or of Paul as the prisoner or, or of, as the, the Lord's prisoner, but instead to partake of the afflictions of the gospel, because if you don't partake in the afflictions now, you will be ashamed later. And so go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 12, uh, verses 41 through 48. Oh, I just happened to open right there. That was lucky. All right, 41. All right, um, so Luke chapter 12, verses 41 through 48. They say, then Peter said unto him, Lord, speak thou this parable unto us or even to all. And the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom the Lord when he cometh shall find him so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall be, uh, begin to beat the men servants and the maidens and to eat and to drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him, cut him in sunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit such things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. Uh, for, unto who, uh, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much more or much be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. And now there's a different context to us now in the sense of the punishment that is received, but you, can, you start to understand how God feels about an unfaithful servant. Luke 9, 26 says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and the holy angels. 
And so clearly there is a real danger uh, in being ashamed of the Lord uh, now, because if you are ashamed now, uh, then the Lord will be ashamed of you when he returns. And so 2 Timothy 1, uh, 8 through 12, so continuing out uh, up until verse 13, it says, Be thou not uh, therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to our own purpose and, and, and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immor immortality to light through the gospel gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And so I don't have it in your notes, but maybe write it off to the side. So we see that Paul wasn't ashamed of that day, but the question that we all need to ask ourselves is, are we? Are we ashamed of that day? And see, the fact is that day is coming, uh, and we need to ask ourselves and really consider uh, this question, will we finish faithful? Uh, because Hebrews 9.27 says, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And so have you considered how that judgment will go? Would you have the same boldness if you knew that you were about to die today? And what if Jesus came back at this very moment? Would you love his appearing? Or would you be instantly filled with massive amounts of regret uh, because of the life that you have lived? And these are all things that we must consider if we want to make sure that we finish our fight at, and finish the, you know, the fight of faith as Paul did, right? And so luckily we get to learn from Paul's challenge to Timothy um, and we can see how we can take the steps that Paul took you know, to have that same kind of boldness. And so go ahead, um, let's look back at t 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, verse 13. Uh, which says, hold fast uh, the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, and this verse is clearly echoed throughout the rest of Second Timothy, the entire book. Uh, and that challenge being to hold on to the sound words that he has been taught, that Timothy has been taught, unlike many others who are actually going to fall away from the faith. And so today I want to look at the fact that if we do hold fast to the form of sound words and faith and love, then we will find mercy when the Lord returns. And I want to just take some time to look at that today. And so uh, let's do that. Let's break it down. But before so, I'm going to pray um, and uh, just ask for the Lord's power in this message. But uh, dear only Father, Lord God, man, I just uh, thank you for your word. Um, man, I, I pray that it would be the comfort for all of us in every situation and at time of life, God. I pray that today that as we read, um, you know, in this, that man, I just hope that we would all walk away just with a greater love for your word, God, um, and that in having that love that it will propel us to want to live a life, uh, God, that is pleasing to you because of, we, we get to see just how much you love us, and I pray that that would motivate us to love you back. So thank you for your word, and I pray that you would just remove me and just say what you need to say today. So thank you, God, for who you are and what you do. Okay. Um, and so 2 Timothy 1.13 says, once again, hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And so first notice by the punctuation that is broken up into three parts. So holding fast the form of sound words, which Timothy had heard from Paul in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And so that first part challenging Timothy to hold fast Right, and so hold fast. The first mention uh, of hold, I um, always like to go back and look at the first mention, is actually has, the, has to do with uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, with Genesis 19:16, which says, And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and sent him with, or and set him without the city. And so Abraham's nep nephew Lot was lingering in the city. And so the angels that God has sent, they grabbed hold of his hand. They pulled him away before destruction came. And so clearly, uh, similar to how we would use the word today, like to grab or to grasp, to clamp down on something. But it is also important to note that when it comes to holding, 
there's an importance about what we hold on to and the life that we live. So Proverbs 4, 1 through 4 says, Hear ye children the instruction of a father. Attend to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Uh, forsake not my law, for I, was, I, oh, goodness, for I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. Uh, my, uh, he taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. And so life is found in holding on to the word of life. And Philippians 2.16 says, holding, the, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And so Paul challenges Timothy to hold these words, but he doesn't just challenge him to hold these words, he challenges him to hold fast. And so the first mention of fast is actually in Genesis 20, 17 through 18, which says, Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bare children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech uh, because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And so God had fast closed up, or tightly closed up, the wombs of the house of Abimelech in this passage, fast denoting that something is like tight or it's shut up. And so we can see this in the concept of fasting as well. So Matthew 9, 14 through 15 says, uh, then came to him the disciples of John saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but the disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, can the children of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, then shall they fast. And so when we fast in the sense of fasting for the Lord, it's not that we just don't eat. That's not the whole point of fasting. The point is that we draw closer to the Lord. We close that gap by removing things out of our life, right? And so there was no point for the disciples in fasting because Jesus was literally right there. There was no point. But after he left, then fasting continued. So uh, all that shows us, right? So we need to be holding on not just holding on, but holding fast to these sound words, um, and we need to uh, make sure that we are holding tightly onto them, right? So uh, we also, uh, the, with, oh, sorry, I'm getting my words twisted up. So we need to hold fast to these sound words, but not just that. Uh, we need to make sure that the words that we're actually holding on to are sound in the first place. And we need to understand, I think Rich talked about it not too long ago, that sound, uh, the context of that in this verse would be to be healthy or wholesome. And we can see that in Isaiah 1, 6, which says, uh, from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, uh, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. And so uh, the first actual mention of sound is in Exodus 19, and this is really cool. So it says, there shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mountain. And so in this passage, you can clearly see that the trumpet sounded, and when the trumpet sounded, it was time to move. And oftentimes throughout the Bible, when you hear a sound that's, associating, that's associated with needing to do something. And so go ahead and turn to Ezekiel 33, 1 through 9. It's a big passage, but it's a cool passage at the same time. Uh, so go ahead and turn there real quick. Uh, let me turn there myself. All right. So Ezekiel 33, verses 1 through 9. It says, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and take not warn, or taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchmen uh, see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. 
When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn, turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. And so the sound of the trumpet alarmed people of the coming danger, and likewise, the word of God alarms us of the coming judgment uh, that it will come upon us. And so this is why we must hold fast onto these words, uh, which leads to a question that we should all ask ourselves, which is, what are you holding on to and why do you continue, continue to hold on to that specific thing? Because it's by God's word that we are alarmed of the things of God and can act accordingly based off of that. And so think of these sound words like being the thing that alerts your spiritual man that something isn't right. Just like how in your physical body, there are things in your body that alert you when things are not right. It's like Psalms 19, nine through 11 says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yeah, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Right? So with all of that, it leads to um, another question, actually, actually, because in 2 Timothy 1.13, it says, so we need to hold fast. We need to hold tightly onto these sound words. And once again, we need to make sure that we are actually holding on to the right words, because Paul says, which thou hast heard of me, which leads to the question of who are you listening to and why do you continue to listen uh, to them? Yes, Timothy has been listening to the sound words from men of God like Paul, and we must do the same. There is a danger in solely listening to people and content that opposes the faith. And our faith started by hearing the sound words, and we must continue to listen to them. So 1 Timothy 4, 16 says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And it's vital that you pay attention to what you're listening to, um, and not in a legalistic way. I'm not saying you can never watch a movie. You know, uh, I'm not saying that you can like never get on social media. I'm not saying any of those specific things. But what I am saying is that the center of the issue is the authority of your life and what you allow to be the authority of your life. So whether that be the government, TV, social media, you know, your mom, yourself, or whatever it may be you have to pay attention and make sure that the authority of your life is the word of God. Like Psalm 38, 12 through 15 says, they also that seek after my life, they lay snares for me and they seek my hurt, uh, or they that seek my hurt uh, speak mischievous things and imagine deceits all the day long. But I was as a deaf man and heard not and was as a dumb man that openeth not his mouth. Thus I was as a man that heareth not and in whose mouth are no reproofs. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope thou wilt hear, O, o Lord my God. And so we need to make sure that we have heard the sound words. And when we do, we need to, to hold fast onto these words. But it doesn't even end there because we aren't called to just hold them. Uh, we are called to hold them in a very specific way. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.13, hold fast a form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So we are called to hold on to these words, but we are to hold on to them in faith and love. And so Hebrews 11, one through three says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are not made of the things which do appear. And so though we cannot physically see God, we are to hold on uh, to his words in faith. And as Hebrews 11 one says, faith is the substance uh, of our hope and it gives evidence of it even though we can't see it. And in a sense, like faith is like belief, but belief in action when there's not necessarily specific physical evidence to support that belief. It's like Genesis 12, one through three says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. But it's actually kind of cool because we get a little bit more uh, of a backstory. Uh, about this passage in Hebrews 11 and Hebrews 11 uh, verse 8, where it says, by faith Abraham 
when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went and so from these passages we can see that the only evidence that abraham had was god's word he didn't know where he was going he didn't know how long it was take from it was going to take for him to get there he just simply trusted god's word and he obeyed and did what he was what he was asked to do and so like abraham Another question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we walking by faith or are we walking by sight? Because uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And Romans 4, 3 says, for what set the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so Abraham believed God's promises, which led him to step out in faith, uh, which produced works that proved that his faith was real, which in turn showed that he truly did believe God. And so we should all ask ourselves, do we truly believe God? And is that actually evident in our walk? Because James 2, 26 says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And so true faith will produce good works, which once again means that uh, we need to ask ourselves, are we walking by faith or are we, are we walking by sight? Because only one of those walks will actually please God. So we find out Hebrews 11, five through six says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God, but without faith, it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so, uh, and the interesting thing is when we see that our faith, that we're struggling in our faith, now it's actually possible, and I would even say probable, that the true problem isn't even necessarily our faith, but that the true problem is actually our heart. And so while faith is important, I will say it's not even uh, as, as important as love. As we can see in 2 Timothy 1, 13, it says that we are to hold fast a form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, right? And so yes, by faith, but also in love. And if we look at 1 Corinthians 13, 2, it says, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Charity being the same agape love, or the same agape self-sacrificing love that propelled the holy God of the universe to send his perfect son to die on the cross for our sins. So 1 John 4, 9 through 10 says, and this was manifested the love of God toward us because, the, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him here, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. And so God loved us enough to die for us, and we need to do the same by dying to self through a wholehearted love uh, for God's word. See, because uh, love is the greatest attribute that we need to display because God himself is love. First John 4, 7 through 8 says, beloved let, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not is not it knoweth not God, for God is love. And 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And so love for God uh, is the key to the successful Christian life. And specifically, we need to understand that to love God is to love his word. God has greatly magnified his word above his own name. Psalm 138, one, uh, one through two says, I will praise thee with my whole heart, uh, before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And so we must love God through his word and let, that be, let it be clear that to love God uh, through his word doesn't mean that you just feel good about God's word. There's a lot of evidence uh, as to how you love God uh, through his word. Um, and, and how you are actually supposed to do that. And John 14, 15 says, uh, if you love me, keep my commandments, is what Jesus said. And this thought of love for God being obedience to God's word is seen throughout the entire Bible. So like, let's look at Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 13. It says, and now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee, but to love the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I commend or command thee this day for thy good. 
Joshua 22, 5 says, But take diligent heed to do the commandment of the law, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to, and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Psalm 119, 47. And I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. John 14, 21 uh, through 24. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will, and I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. Judas said unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, uh, is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us or, and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father uh, which sent me. And First John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. And so it's extremely evident uh, that true love is obedience to God's word, and we even see this in the first mention of love in the Bible. Genesis 22, 1 through 2 says, And it came to pass, after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon uh, one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And so clearly, Abraham loved his son. Uh, and, you know, we can see that that's clear because it says that this, your son uh, whom thou lovest. But it's also clear that Abraham loved God more than he loved his son because he was obedient to God and doing what God had asked him to do. So Genesis 22, 3 says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. And though Abraham had waited for years, Years and years to finally have this begotten son, Isaac, whom he loved, he still walked by faith and showed that his heart, uh, that his heart was truly in obedience to God by uh, loving him, by being, by following what he said. Okay, so he was willing uh, to even sacrifice his own son to be obedient to God, which leads to the question of, do you love God's word, but is it so, is it evident by your obedience to God's word? Because do you, uh, do you hold God's word so close to your heart uh, that you do everything physically possible to obey it? Psalm 119, 9 through 11 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so you must get into God's word so that you know, um, know God's word so that you can actually follow God's word. And then you can start to learn about how much God loves you. And this in turn will strengthen you so that you want to have the same love for him. First John 4.19 says, we love him because, his, because he first loved us. And if you don't know how much God loves you, you won't be propelled to have the desire to love him. And that's why it's so, it's so vital to have a daily walk with the Lord um, in his word so that you can see God's heart for you. So Psalm 116.1 says, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Psalm 119.97 says, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Joshua 1, 9 says, Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and have a good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Isaiah 41, 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yeah, I will help thee. Yeah, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 43, 1 through 4, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest, uh, walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and, and Seba for, for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. And so do you know God's heart for you? And, you know, we must hold fast a form of sound words in faith and love uh, because he loved us first. And so this is this love being evident in our new position that we have now that we are in Christ. 
So once we were lost, now we are made new in Christ. Ephesians 2, uh, 4, 1 through 7 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So no doubt being in Christ, walking in love and in faith, is walking in the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit of our Lord. And so Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, uh, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, uh, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And so that fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit, we have to understand that it is a singular fruit. Um, it is evident by all these characteristics. So the truth is you can't walk in faith without love, and you can't love without faith, and it's the same with all the other attributes. They come pack packaged together as one, and you can see how tightly you are holding on to the sound words um, it, by how evident this fruit is in your life. Because if you are holding on to these sound words, then this fruit will be evident in your life, which leads to another question of does the fruit produced by your life show that you are actually in Christ? Because Acts 4, 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them and uh, that they had been with Jesus. And so would the people around you say the same thing? Would they take knowledge that you had been with Jesus? Or would they say otherwise? Which in Ephesians 4, 17 through 19, Paul says this, uh, This I say, Therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. And so is that what people see in your life? And remember once again, why Paul is writing this. He knows that the end is coming, and which means that he knows that he's drawing close to that judgment seat. Once again, Hebrews 9, 27 says, and it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And so Paul was going into his judgment with boldness, and he was going into his, judge, into his judgment with joy. Once again, 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8 says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. And so Paul wanted Timothy to be able to say the same thing at the end of his life. And once again, that is why he's challenging Timothy uh, to continue in those sound words. So 2 Timothy 1.13 again, hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. And it's a very important to note that holding fast a form of sound words, you can't do that without, uh, you, you can't do that without faith. You can't have faith without love. Um, and you can't love unless you are in Christ, which leads to another question of, are you actually in Christ? All right, so if not, your judgment will look different. Um, and we see this in Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Instead of going through the judgment seat of Christ, if you're not in Christ, you'll actually go through the great white throne judgment, uh, which it says this, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which, which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so in this judgment, everyone is condemned because they're judged by their own works. And we all know Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through, Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the thing is, these people didn't accept that free gift of eternal life through Christ, which means that their names are not written in the books of life which also means that, uh, that they are cast into the eternal lake of fire because good works and good merits, they're not enough to pacify God's wrath. Only believing on the death, burial, and resurrection of his son can someone be saved. 
of which Romans 10, 9 through 10, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so it's a free gift. And if you haven't already, I would just want to ask, man, accept it today uh, because your eternal destiny, it's in your own hands. And God being the loving uh, you know, father that he is, he is extending his hand to you and it's up to you. It's your choice of whether or not you're going to grab hold to, onto his hand you know, and accept that free gift. But it, it's in your hands. God is reaching out to you and asking you to join his family. Uh, but it's your choice. You have to make that choice. And just bringing this all together with all of that, um, you know, and once again, I'm just going to keep saying this verse because, you know, I want us to remember this verse. 2 Timothy 1.13, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Um, we actually find out something really cool after 2 Timothy 1.13. When you look at the remaining verses, we get to see an example of men who do not hold fast the form of sound words, and we get to see an example of a man who did hold fast the form of sound words. So 2 Timothy, 4, or 2 Timothy 1, 14 through 18 says, That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest that all they which are, that are in Asia be turned away from me, uh, of whom are Philegus and uh, Hermonogenes. Uh, I think that's how you say that. The Lord give mercy unto the house of once a forest, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. And so uh, first taking note of verse 15, which says, this thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me and of whom are uh, Philegus and, and uh, Hermonogenes. And ultimately what we see is if you don't hold fast a form of sound words, what's going to happen is that you're going to turn away. Uh, you'll turn away from the faith. And this is not just a problem with these men. This is a problem that we see throughout Second Timothy. Um, and Paul warns Timothy of these kind of men throughout the book. And so Second Timothy 3, 1 through 9 says, uh, this know also. And actually, go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. Second uh, Timothy 3, uh, verses 1 through 9. I'll actually take the time to go to that verse. <coughs> Okay, so 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 9 says this, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And I'll say, in the context of this, we are in those last days, so just understand that. So, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, uh, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, uh, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. And then go ahead and turn to uh, chapter 4 as well, verses 1 through 5. It says, charge thee therefore uh, before God, uh, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away, uh, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of thy ministry. And so uh, what we see <clears throat> is that no doubt, you know, if you don't hold fast those words, once again, you know, the outcome is that you're going to turn away uh, from the faith. And so what will happen is that if you are saved, you will suffer major loss at the judgment seat of Christ. 
Um, if you are not saved, you will go through that great white throne judgment that we talked about before. And once again, that choice uh, is yours. And so the question that we all need to ask ourselves is, are we holding fast to those sound words? And so Paul gives Timothy a wonderful example of someone who did hold fast to the form of sound words in faith and love, which are in Christ. So 2 Timothy 1, 16 through 18 says, uh, the Lord give mercy unto the house of once a forest, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. And so despising the shame that would have been associated with Paul, once a forest sought him out very diligently, diligently, but he didn't only seek him out, he found him. And the cool thing about that is that that's actually very similar to us and as we seek out uh, the word of God. So Jeremiah 29, uh, 11 through 13 says, for I, know, uh, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And so once before us, he was seeking the, the word of the Lord through the mouth of Paul, and uh, most definitely echoing the life that we should all have in seeking the word of God with a whole heart. So Psalm 119, one through two, it says, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. Which leads to another question, which is, you know, are you diligently seeking the Lord with your whole heart? Um, because if you're seeking God, you must do it diligently and you must do it with your whole heart. This is how you hold fast the form of sound words. And it's actually interesting because uh, diligently in 2 Timothy 1.7 has the same root word as the word study in 2 Timothy 2.15, which says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so do you study God's word? You know, do you love it so much that you seek it out so that you will not be ashamed before your maker? And so as we already know from looking at it earlier, to love God is to love his word. And now we see that to love his word, we need to diligently seek his word by studying his word so that we can know it and actually follow it. And this is how we will be successful and unashamed at the judgment seat. Uh, Joshua 1, 8 says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. And first, John 4, 17 through 18. It says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. But 1 John 2, 5, it says, But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. And so if we want to have the same boldness that Paul had, uh, when he was at the end of his life, we need to hold fast the form of sound words uh, in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. And then on Judgment Day, we will find the same thing that Paul requested for once of for us. In verse 18, it says, The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus thou knowest very well. And so if you hold fast, uh, the form of sound words uh, and you walk or in walk, <clears throat> excuse me, if you hold fast the form of sound words and, uh, and, and obey God's word, um, then you will walk into your judgment knowing that you will find mercy because you have fought a good fight by doing what the Lord asks you to do. And so Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, uh, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus Christ, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, and this leads to the last question, which is on judgment day, will you find mercy or will you be ashamed at that day? The choice is yours. And I'm going to go ahead and pray us out um, real quick. Um, so dear only Father, Lord God, um, man, I just want to say, uh, God, just thank you for your word. And I just pray through, you know, being at church, doing what we do. I think it can be so easy to just go through the motions. It can be so easy to just, um, you know, you just coast in your Christian life. Um, God, I pray that the center of our lives would just be 
your words, Lord. I pray that each and every one of us, that the reason why we're here, the reason why we do anything that we do is just because we, we're like David. God, we just love your word, Lord. And I pray that your word would be the single most greatest joy that we have in our life, God. And I pray that from that we'll find strength. God, I pray that from that uh, we'll live pleasing lives, God, as we hold fast to those sound words, Lord. But I just pray that we'll all have that heart and that uh, we could all take away something even from this message, Lord. Um, I just hope that, you know, my stuttering lips didn't get in the way of your word and just pray that, um, man, that we would hold fast to form a sound word. So on judgment day, uh, God, we have a life that's pleasing to you and we can walk in uh, knowing that we'll find mercy because we did what you asked us to do. So just thank you so much for who you are, for giving your word and for all that you do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.